Yeah, welcome to Smart Sheriff, dumb idea, the wild west of government assisted parenting. So we are going to be talking about uh, a, a law that was approved in South Korea, right? And this first that we have to give you a little bit of background information, like how could something crazy like this happen? And then we'll go through first like the flagship uh, application that we tested initially, which was Smart Sheriff, then some more work that we did on Smart Dream, and then there's other similar apps by mobile operators that we also took a look at a little bit more recently. And then where do we go from here after all this work, right? So um, in this talk, we will have some insight about South Korean uh, culture and politics. Um, we'll see some basics in Android reversing that were helpful for us. Uh, for doing the test, and then some difficulties in the ethics of disclosing issues, like you know the whole problem of uh, disclosure, right? So I'm Abraham, and he's Fabian. We work for Cure53, uh, which is a company in Germany. And I know uh, some of our reports are public, so if you are the kind of person who likes reading pen testing reports or reports, the ones that we can publish are here. So if you're the kind of person who likes reading reports, you can just go there and read reports. Um, and some of you might uh, maybe know my name from OWASP OWTF, the Offensive Web Testing Framework, which is an OWASP flagship project. Um, if you are interested in that, just go to this URL, put this in your browser, and you can try it and play with that. So now Fabian will tell us how all this crazy stuff happened. Okay. So this whole project started because a privacy and digital rights group from South Korea called Open Net Korea heard about this law and were very worried about what that could mean for the, um, for the children in South Korea. Then Citizen Lab, uh, they are at, from the university in Toronto. They, every year they have a summer institute that's like a short few day conference where they meet and talk about privacy and surveillance issues all around the world. So they had the smart sheriff and this new law from Korea as one of their projects and we then joined their force to do the technical analysis of these mobile application. So we did the technical stuff, the reversing and wrote a report and Citizen Lab and OpenNet Korea together talked with Moiba, the company and also with the Korean government and yeah, so this is all how it started. And part of this resource is also funded by the Open Technology Fund. So as we mentioned, the story is from South Korea. So I'm sorry if you were hoping to hear some crazy technical stuff from North Korea. Uh, it's, it's this other country. Um, South Korea is an extremely interesting country when it comes to tech stuff, because according to this one survey that I um, looked for, they have extremely high smartphone usage in their country. If you look at the total population, you are at almost 90%. And this is not true for countries here in Europe. We are barely just scraping like the 70% in some of the countries or even lower. And if you even look at just the young adults, you are basically at 100% smartphone usage in that country. Everybody has a smartphone. And you can also imagine that a lot of children have very early on already smartphones. It's just a very prominent thing in their culture to have right now. That's also the reason why the Korean government and the general population is very worried about their children. They are scared of cyberbullying and um, addiction for, to games and social networks and all this kind of stuff that we are also discussing in the West. And they came up with this new law that they could um, introduce in, in the Telecommunication Business Act, which states that the mobile operators have to provide some kind of adult content filtering services if they want to do business with uh, minors. So in late 2014, this, uh, this law was introduced, but very vague still, like what does adult content filtering service mean? How is that technically implemented? No idea. A little bit later, a few months uh, in early 2015, they added a few details to this law, but again, not very technical. Just, for example, here one excerpt stating that if the 
uh, if, if the service or the app is not working for 15 days, if somebody has disabled it, the parent has to be notified, for example. So very high level abstract law and rule about this, still not very technical what that really means. But we do know how this practically, what, what the practical result of this was, and that's basically that now you have a mandatory application that is installed on the uh, phones of the children and also the parents if they are buying a phone. And there's also no opt-out for it. So even if a parent says, I don't want to do this, I don't want to install this, I trust my child, they, there's no opt-out in, in, in the law, they have to still install this. And that makes this application a very interesting target because basically you have a whole country, the, the children of a whole country exposed by an application that could potentially be very harmful. And here's a photo in front of a Korean uh, phone store where they are informing the public about this new law that they are now like, obliged to provide these filters and uh, this blocking services that the apps have to, installed, have to be installed on the child's phone. And then some of the details like alerting the parents after 15 days if it was disabled and stuff like these high level uh, rules that are mentioned in the law. And also, a direct result of this law is that the Korean government, or the Communication Commission to be exact, funded a public company, the Mobile, uh, Mobile Internet Business Association, with over $2.7 million to develop the go-to application, and that is SmartSheriff. And when we look at the results shortly, you are, it's kind of crazy how much money they spent on this application and what they got with that. Uh, so to the defense, I guess a lot of money also goes into like call center hotlines for concerned parents to call and all these other services around it. But it's really scary what, what like the result for $2.7 million is. So Moiba developed actually two applications. One is Smart Sheriff and the other one is Smart Dream. And Smart Sheriff is the one that is like mandatory by the law and is the one that is most prominently installed uh, on, on the most phones by the children. And so that is what we mainly had a look at. Smart Dream is this other service and application that Moiba offers. It's not mandatory by the law, but we also had a look at it because it's very tightly put together with a Smart Sheriff you will later see. Uh, they have basically the login, same login screen and stuff like this. So it's also something that parents may choose to install, and that one was even crazier. And of course, because of this law, the mobile operators are obliged to provide this filter, so they also have their own apps, but they were not very prominent, but they now gain traction that because smart share is kind of a decline, I guess, at least we hope so. You can also see like uh, how happy people are about these applications. And towards the end of this um, presentation, we also show some of the research we have done on, on these ones. So let's start with Smart Sheriff, right? So in Smart Sheriff, we have, uh, so there's two applications, right? It's, it's really one application, but there's like two possible usages. So you have the parent and the child. So the child is the one that is going to be like monitored and stuff. And so the first time you install the application, you kind of choose like how the application is going to be used. If it's going to be used like to, to block and monitor the usage of a child, or if it's going to be the parent, right? And that gives the parent like control like about certain things that I'm going to explain now, right? So one of the things that the parent can do is, well, you cannot use the phone during class hours, or you cannot use the phone during the night or things like this, right? So you can like deny or allow access at certain times of the day, which is this uh, first tab here. Uh, another thing that you can do is to see like all the applications that are installed on the phone and you can like allow or deny access to all those applications. So you can, for example, say, well, you cannot use Skype or whatever because I don't want you to chat with your friends or something like this. So stuff like this is possible and then there's um, a third tab that was not fully functional, but we still uh, review the implementation of it, uh, which is the web blocking. So which sites are being visited by the child, and how, you know, like, if you want to block some of them or something like this, right? So that is basically the functionality uh, for a parent in Smart Sheriff. So now let's compare a little bit the kind of information that these two applications store, right? So we have 
Smart Sheriff, which is the one that we pen tested first, this one has the association, right? Like which phone number is the phone number of the parent, which phone number is the phone number of the child, and the link between the two, uh, children, uh, children's names, children's uh, birthdays. Then we also have like the usage statistics, when is the, at what times of the day the phone is used, the installed apps, and the time that is browsing or playing games and the visited or blocked URL. So that is the kind of information, Smart Sheriff. And then Smart Dream is a little bit more scary because it's actually recording the messages that uh, children type. So that's kind of more kind of uh, <laughs> privacy kind of scary, right? So all the messages that children send with instant messaging to other children and stuff like this, that will be the kind of information that Smart Dream, this other application that we will cover a little bit later, um, was storing. So now let's talk about the setup challenges, right? Because, I mean, Korean really is a beautiful language, but if you're a European and you are not really into languages, like when you try to test this, you are like, well, I mean, it looks cool, but what is it, right? Like, you don't really know like what its button is doing, and to identify like all the attack surface of the application is, is kind of hard because of the language uh, barrier, right? So one of the things that we had to do was to repackage the, to repackage the application, right? Like, so how many of you have experience like reversing uh, Android applications? Okay, so a few of you, right? So for the ones who are not that familiar, there's this tool that is called APK tool, so you can take the APK, which is the Android uh, application, and you can unpack it into these like intermediate languages, it's called Smiley, and then one of the files is called strings.xml, so what we had to do is just take the file, uh, Google Translate it, and then we get like the English version of it, and then we can pack the application again and we get like the prop proper like English version of the application so that we know what is going on and what the buttons do. Um, unfortunately, there were some other challenges like, I mean, this is cool, but, but still there were some, uh, some pages that were loaded like in a web view. So it is really the website that is returning all the Korean. And in those cases, we had to like intercept the the response like with verb and just Google Translate it, and then get it in the application like in English, like the full thing, right? So those were some of the challenges that we faced. And another trick that we did as we uh, unpackaged the application was like to set up some logs, like well, when is certain functionality being reached? Uh, so just log some messages and try like to debug like whereabouts. Um, are the things, right? Like the interesting functionality, like how to reach it and stuff like this. So just some help for, for debugging. So now after all these like preliminaries, we are ready to start. And the first thing that we found was a remote code execution uh, through a web view using a JavaScript, which was using a JavaScript interface. Now a JavaScript interface is a way to invoke uh, Java from JavaScript, which is an amazing idea. Uh, and in all the Android versions, Android 2.4 to Android 4.1, it gives you like the ability to execute like arbitrary code, right? Now, uh, so that's the problem, the uh, JavaScript interface, but where is the problem here? Like, why is this exploitable? Anybody? Nobody, come on. Exactly, yes, HTTP. That's it, because all this is going in clear text over the network. So if I'm like a bad guy and I'm wearing a mask like this in a cafe in front of the school, right? Like all the children get out of the school and they connect to the free Wi-Fi. And what happens? Like. Anybody can change that, right? Like all this traffic that the phones transmit, you know, that goes like from the servers to the phones is all in the clear. So anybody can change that and, and just get remote code execution on the phone, right? So that was one of the things that we found. And now um, there were two tests, right? So first, we did the, the first uh, penetration test. We gave them the report. There was like the whole disclosure process. Then there was a second pen test. 
so now we're going to look at how they fix this and what we found, right? So the first uh, impression was good, right? Like now we see like HTTPS, so so far so good, right? And I mean, this was all okay in principle, but what was really funny is that in Android, like you can override the, um, you know, like the, the native uh, APIs, like when you get some SSL errors and stuff, so this is the code. If you get an SSL error, so unreceived SSL error, proceed, right? So if you get like a self-signed certificate, what can possibly go wrong? Like proceed, right? And if there's any problem with the host name, whatever, just return true, right? So that was like all the logic. So just skip like all SSL warnings, like, you know, just proceed and that's it. So the fix was really not very helpful because like anybody can man in the middle steal all the all the children and change all the traffic and there's just no problem. This is going to accept like every uh, wrong certificate ever. So that's really funny. And now uh, this is uh, also very funny. So this is the cipher text and this is the clear text. Any guesses about what's going on here? Algorithm. Say again. Uh, is really XOR, <laughs> right? And then this was, uh, so they are really, they have like a static key on the APK, and they simply XOR this, this static key against the phone, and then you get the ciphertext, and then, because, I mean, it's XOR, it's cool. Like, you can use it for encryption and decryption, so you have a little bit less work to do. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically what they were doing. And to their credit, there were these null characters here. So maybe, like, if you run, like, strings on the APK, maybe you wouldn't get the full key. Like, it'll be, like, a little bit weird. So we, but, I mean, it was a Java application, so that's not much help, right? So you can just get the key. Uh, you can just get the key, the key from the APK, and from there you can encrypt and decrypt like the way the app is doing, and that's it. So now let's look at the um, improvement in cryptography after the first report. So now we got uh, more crypto, right? Like when you have a problem, you add more crypto to it, and then it's better, right? So they added more crypto. So this is the this is the JSON before. This is the this is what, what what the mobile phone was sending to the server afterwards, and now this one you can see is uh, base 64. But what do you guess they were using? Any thoughts? So they were using AES, but again with a key that was on the APK. So I mean, anybody that has the APK can just get the key from the APK, and you can encrypt and decrypt the same way that the application is doing. So uh, just to recap all this uh, crypto fail, so we have this is the this is the JSON, right? So you have the phone number, you XOR it with a key that is on the APK. Then you take all this JSON, you run it through AES with the second key that is also on the APK, and then you base64 encode it. Then you send it on the wire with this uh, SSL that I showed before that is going to ignore all SSL warnings. And then after all that mess, then the server is going to reply like in clear text. OK? So just to recap, that this is like the whole design of uh, the API. We thought it was really funny, right? So yeah, all this effort like for nothing, right? So now let me tell you a story. Let's pretend that there's a child in the class that is like really mean. Like he really wants to make the life of every other child in the class miserable. He wants to mess with every other child, right? He wants really to mess with them a lot. So thank you. Thanks to uh, Smart Sheriff, uh, this guy has a bully API, uh, an API that is cool for uh, bully kids, right? For kids that want to mess with other kids. So. I mean, I mean, and in general, like in life, uh, you should always ask questions, right? Like when you ask questions, amazing things happen. Like sometimes maybe uh, you don't get an answer or you get a different answer than the one that you were hoping for. But most of the time, like amazing things happen when you ask questions. And this is a great example of that. So 
uh, you ask Smart Sheriff, hey, Smart Sheriff, this is the child that I want to mess with. And then the Smart Sheriff API tells you, oh, well, this is the parent phone number. And with that, you can already do like some damage, like as a bully, right? Like to mess with a child, knowing the parent phone number is already like some, you know, there's some damage there. But as a bully, like what you really want is to get to the logging interface. And the parent phone number is the username. But come on, like Smart Shape, like give me, give me the password, right? Like you can just ask politely, like, can you give me the password as well? And of course. Uh, the Smart Sheriff LPI will also give you the password so that you can like fully log in as the parent. And as I explained at the beginning, what does this give you access to? Like, you can't say, well, this child cannot use the phone ever. Like, you know, from like all the 24 hours of the day, the phone is blocked. No applications can be used and all this kind of crap that parents can do, right? So it's really messed. Now, to their credit, the password was uh, encrypted with the XOR thing, but as I explained before, the XOR key is on the APK, so that's really no help. Like, anybody can uh, decrypt that, and that's it. So this is technically how it looked like. You can see, like, we were using this uh, operating system to test this. Um, uh, so we were running this uh, curl command, right? And this is the phone number, which is uh, encrypted with the XOR, and then you get on the reply, the parent phone number and the password as well, right? So, and you can see here uh, the phone number with the XOR is this, and then this is the password, uh, and it just decodes to this. So, just really funny that you get the parent phone number and the password of the parent, so you get like full access to mess with a child. And because in Korea, like, there are so many uh, people using this because um, it's a mandated app, right? Like, it's by law, it's enforced. So there's so many that we can, like, we run a script that could, like, just try numbers at random in South Korea and just, you know, get parents and children and passwords and everything. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, run this quick demo. So this is, uh, this is the script running. So you can see here, like, we found like a parent, and this is the password of the parent, then this is the child, and this is the, the parent phone number and the password. And now if uh, we forward a little bit, we can see here that there's like another uh, child has been found, and then you get the parent phone number and the password. It's just such a mess, right? Like you can just get all this uh, parent access to so many children in the country, right? Because, I mean, why not? So this is basically uh, one of the things that we found. Another thing that we found is that you can also, because there's like absolutely no authentication for anything, you can also like fake usage. So you can say, for example, hey, this child, this phone number, this guy is searching for porn, right? And then when this child goes home, he's going to have this tough conversation with his parents, right? Like, why, why were you searching for this, right? So. Uh, if you think about it, right, like for the for the bullies, this this is really cool, right? I to mess with all the children and stuff. So this is a device idea, a session cookie. But even in our report, like when you see, if some of you like uh, read the report, you will see like on the device ID because it didn't matter. We just had like whatever or you know hello or something like this on this parameter. It was like ignored. Like just knowing the phone number, you could uh, update a lot of settings and stuff or fake the usage. So now let's see how they fix this, right? So in the, f the fix basically is there's not much difference. I mean, at the beginning is, hey, Smart Sheriff, this is the child that I want to mess with, and then still gave you the parent phone number. And then what's the password? And then here there was a small difference. Instead of giving you the password, it was giving us this asterisk, right? Now in our first report, uh, when we gave like the proof of concept, like when you send a request like this, you get the um, you get the password and all this. We were using curl, right? So when we changed the user agent to something that was not curl, like you know I whatever you know any user agent, then we found like two or three of the endpoints would still give you the password in clear text. So that was really funny. That changing the user agent, the the originally reported attack still worked. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that they fixed that later, but it was just so funny. Um, and this still worked uh, to fake the usage. Like you can still like impersonate and fake like 
you know, some child is searching for weird stuff so that he gets in trouble with the parents, so you can still, you can still do this kind of stuff. Now, another thing that we found was XSS, and they fixed the one that we originally reported, but just taking a very quick look at the website, we found another one on the second test, and this is, uh, this is really funny because, uh, or reports, because are public, they are indexed by Google. So I'm going to show now a demo now. If we search for this domain, because the XSS has been indexed by Google because our reports are public, uh, if you search like by the domain and you click on the, on the link that of the proof of concept that was in the report, like you can see like Google has indexed the XSS, so still works. <laughs> It's just like you have really like fucked up when, you know, some Pentest report is public and the proof of concept still work and stuff, right? And this is like on the source, like the injection point where, you know, just closing the function and doing the alert in there and some just valid JavaScript. It's just so funny when you think about it, right? Like still works and stuff. Okay, so um, this is a section that we called why not because like we were like so in shock, like it was so broken, like, we were like, well, why not? I mean, you can do it like that. So um, this is like, why not? Like a, uh, Tomcat's uh, 6.029, which was released in 2009. I mean, why not use this for uh, a mandated government application that is supposed to protect children? I mean, why not? You can do that if you want, right? So released seven years ago, that's it. Uh, another funny thing was this uh, filter for the web filtering. So if it starts with HTTP and does not contain uh, Moiva, then, uh, you know, then it's, uh, if, it, if it contains, so if it contains this, it's allowed, right? So you can just add a fake parameter co uh, containing this and you can access any website. So you, you go like block.com and then you add like blah and then, you know, just make sure that it contains this and, you know, and then it's, it, it bypasses the filter. It was, you know, so broken. Uh, other thing is in Android, you have like these uh, different like storage for the application, right? Like uh, the internal storage of an application is something that is like protected by the Android permissions. Other applications cannot read there, but they were taking the database that was in this like secure storage and they were st storing it on the, on the SD card. So you can just punch a child on the face and get the SD card off the phone and you go like the database, you know, or other malicious apps like running on the phone can, can read that from the SD card as well. So it was just all messed up. Uh, another funny thing was they were using uh, unlicensed fonts. So you can see here, this font is made with the trial version of Font Creator. You may not use this font for commercial purposes, right? So you have like these people who like applied to get like a government grant right, and deploy like all these application to defend children and stuff using unlicensed fonts as well, so it's just funny. Then, you know, development and debugging uh, snippets everywhere, like uh, test directory, AAA directory, lots of like crap everywhere. We had like, there was one of the URLs was revealing like internal paths to stuff. Uh, we also had like test phone numbers, test passwords, uh, so just in summary, like a big pile of poo, right? We had like XSS leaking personal data over the API, no authentication, no transport security, ignoring SSL warnings on the second round, even a SQL injection inside of the mobile app and just don't take a word for, uh, a word for it. Like in this case, this is a report that we could publish. So you just to take a look at the reports and it's all there. Like just, you know, just take a look. So now Fabian will tell us what happened afterwards with the disclosure of the first and the second report. So as mentioned earlier, we did like the technical part and Citizen Lab and OpenNet Korea did all the disclosure with Moiba and talking to the government. And this is the first report that they published. They are posing, they're asking the question if the kids are all right because of this law and because of Smart Sheriff. And they are going over the findings and the implications that has and the risks for the children, hoping that that would get any change. So Moiva also obviously reacted, as we mentioned earlier, like they received this first report and uh, fixed stuff. Um, they also released their own press releases. So here's a press release where they are saying that they continue to improve security and use now SSL, 
reads like as if they are very proactive and if they are working and try to improve the application and no mention at all that there were serious issues and no credits given to Citizen Lab or anybody who did any work on this, but just, I guess, to keep the customers happy. A second press release from them where they were even saying that they are going to deprecate the old API because that makes absolute sense in this case. This is so horrible. They completely have to redesign that. That's not, like, they cannot keep putting patches on that. Uh, so that made actually sense, um, but they are still like saying, sorry for the inconvenience, please update, and we continuously working on strengthening the security of the application. Again, sounds like as if they were proactively trying to fix everything and no mention of that there were serious issues found. Um, yeah. It also got some media attention. Um, so, yeah, it got it picked up a little bit, but the public outcry that at least Citizen Lab and OpenNet Korea were hoping for to get some political change did not happen. Uh, people were writing some articles about, but yeah, they, they basically just ignored it and just hoped to wait it out. So we as researchers, we kind of felt like, oh shit, we gave Moiba just a free pen test and we felt like this whole thing backfired. Instead of taking this whole thing down, we just told them now how, take, how they can fix the, uh, the, like the URL blocking bypass and all these things that we actually kind of want to get rid of, rid of at all. So we just felt, it felt to us like we were just helping improving a surveillance app that we really didn't like and we wanted to get rid of. So then we had the second round where we showed that, oh, sh basically didn't fix anything, and the things they fixed, they fixed wrong. Uh, so Citizen Lab published a second report where they're asking the question if the um, kids are still at risk, and going over the report and basically saying again, this is not a good idea what you have there, Korea, please change that. And then Moiva reacted and even pulled the application from the Play Store. Where they were writing here a very whiny press release that uh, they offered services for so many years for free and children are so at risk, but yeah, we decided to stop Smart Sheriff now and uh, please move on to alternative applications. And we read news articles about that the Smart Sheriff app disappeared and we were really stoked about it. We really celebrated. We thought we fought this war against this awful application and got rid of it. But then we realized that something shady was happening. And here, a Citizen Lab added an update to their report. And it basically reads that, yeah, Moiba removed Smart Sheriff uh, from the Google Play Store. But it looks like the API is still active. OK, well, maybe it takes a while for them to shut it off. That's fine. You know, don't immediately cut everything off. I get that. But it looks also like that they republished Smart Sheriff under a different name called Cyber Safety Zone. And that appeared suddenly on the Google Play Store. And it looks like that they just did some cosmetic changes of that application, but otherwise it's the same thing. So let's have a look. So did, did we fail? Did we not take it down? This is a screenshot from the T Store, which is an alternative Android app store in Korea. And you can see that the name changed. It's not called Smart Sheriff anymore. It's called Cyber Relief or Cyber Safety Zone, depending on how Google Translate feels that day. Um, and yeah, different, different application logo, the hat that it had previously is missing. But the screenshots look awfully close like Smart Sheriff looked like. So let's try to find the difference between Smart Sheriff and Cyber Safety Zone. Uh, so you can see like the logo change, it's now green, and some, some minor text changes here, but otherwise it's clearly the same thing. So they just rebranded this whole thing. Also, while preparing for this talk, I obviously visit the Moiba website a lot, and it turns out that suddenly this old website disappeared. So the, the old hat logo they had, the Smart Sheriff branding, uh, suddenly was not there anymore, and this is how their new website looked like. So different logo now, different texts. Again, like same as the app, try to hide the issues, get rid of the name, uh, probably stop people from associating Moiba with this awful app Smart Sheriff, but this new application Cyber Safety Zone. Um, to their credit, there is one latest press release here from the beginning of this year where they increased the password from four digits to, I think, six or nine digits. Uh, so at least there's that. Um, and here you can now see they also offer a web interface for the new Smart Sheriff, the Cyber Safety Zone. 
And as you can see, it's also the, basically the exact same thing. You can do the time management, uh, so restricting the usage for certain times for the child. You have the app management, where you can see the installed apps and deny access to them. And you have also the website management, where you can uh, block certain applications and so forth. So to summarize this, Smart Sheriff and Cyber Safety Zone are the same thing. Moibar never deprecated the API, even though they said this in, the, um, in, in their press release. They renamed the application, and I guess just to hide the bad press when you Google for it, and now they are just trying to hide and wait out all these issues. But also what with Smart Sheriff, because that was then was wondering, as, what is up with this application with Smart Sheriff? Is that bad? How, how awful could Smart, Sheriff, uh, Smart Dream be? And because now also they offer this web login, you can see that Smart Dream here on the right and Smart Sheriff is very close together. Like this is, when you click on login, this is coming up, both fields. And in fact, they are basically a login into the same backend, as I guess, just for non techy people to make it clear that they, where they can log in. So let's have a look at Smart, Smart Dream. As, as mentioned earlier, it's not mandatory by the law, but still um, uh, could be installed by the parents, and, and we also wanted to have a look at that. So it also comes in two modes, the parent mode and the child mode. And on the parent mode, you can then see the logged messages from your child, like the SMS and Kakao Talk messages, if they contain a harmful word. And on the child mode, it basically just installs itself as, um, yeah, as mo for monitoring purposes and is monitoring the SMS and the Kakao Talk messages. Two interesting things here, which are very clever actually. So first of all, how do they get access to Kakao Talk, which is a third party application and an, an instant messenger very popular in Korea? How get, do they get those messages, the child types? They install themselves or they request the special accessibility permissions on, on Android, so what you would use if you would develop a text-to-speech application or like an external braille keyboard or something like this for, um, for disabled people, um, you, they, they abuse that to get access to the text areas in this third-party application, so it's super clever. And they not only use that for Kakao Talk, but also the Google searches the child types into the Google search widget, so also when they contain um, harmful words, they will get locked to the service. And this is then how the web backend looks like. Um, uh, as you can see, like here on the left, this is Smart Dream and this is Smart Sheriff, so it's very close together. That's why it's also interesting, so maybe a lot of people will also use it. Here's a view of the uh, parent app. You can see here two locked SMS messages, two test messages. And also you can here see the uh, web backend, which is basically the same thing. Also you can see like the logged SMS messages uh, for your child. So first of all, uh, who is a web security guy and can guess why the H1 is so much bigger than the other text? It's pretty obvious. Obviously there's also an XSS issue on their parental interface. Again, like Smart Sheriff, you can push fake things to the, um, to the API by just like, no, there is no auth authentication for that. So you can just like in a big grand scheme access all the parents using this application by just pushing fake SMS with an XS, uh, XSS payload. Or you message an XSS payload uh, to your friend and include an insult and then it gets locked and you access as the parent. And also you can see like all this stuff is also happening, not over SSL, and, yeah, whatever. Funny thing also is when you register an account, they have this SMS authentication, so you need a Korean number, they try to send an SMS to, but they implemented this check in JavaScript, so you can just like <laughs> bypass that form. Uh, they fixed that, but if you install the, uh, if you use the app directly in the API directly, you can still register an account, so like they also don't get that right. But the really scary thing is that Smart Dream, at least at the time when I tested this a uh, couple of months ago, they had stored over 700,000 messages from children and from over 55,000 registered children. And I know this number because when I was testing, I saw that the, uh, my identifier was just incrementing by ones, by one, and then I just tried the API and see if I, if I request a different message with a different ID, if I can get that. And so, as it turns out, you can just write a script and just enumerate all the child IDs and uh, their messages and just dump all the stored messages on the service. 
Uh, to protect the privacy here, those are just random Korean characters. I replaced every Korean character with something else. But this is how it would basically look like if you uh, let the script run. Also, Smart Dream tries to tag each SMS with if it's like violence or assault or threat or kill. Like depending on the harmful word they are logging, they try to give, could be slang or whatever that the parents don't understand. So uh, they provide some tagging for it so for parents to see what's happening there. But yeah, that's just scary. Now let's have a look at what exactly they log because what, what does harmful message mean or harmful words mean? Uh, so this is probably the most offensive slide uh, in our presentation because these are the over 1,000 harmful words that are monitored by Smart Dream. But if you start looking into what these, uh, what these words actually are and you translate some of them, it's very troublesome what kind of words are included there. So first of all, obviously a child could have problems like with their parents being divorced or single parent. Like that is already very personal searches a child could do if they have trouble with that. But also for girls like menstruation or um, words like multiculturalism or black history. Right? What the fuck, why is, this a, why is that a harmful word to a child could search for? Or just literally sarcasm or guy, so, so the term like I like this guy or I like this girl or something like this. All this dating is all like logged by the parent. This is definitely not harmful and I, I think there's a good case of saying this is a very big invasion of privacy for the children. Uh, so all this kind of stuff gets logged. Um, so now a little bit funny story on how, like so I, I wrote this up as a report Citizen Lab then uh, got in contact with Moiba, and to their credit, Moiba really changed. So they went through all these phases of a, of a vendor receiving a, a report for the first time. First they were in denial, then they were angry and threatened you with legal reasons, but now they accept it and actually work with you. So the, the response of this new report that we sent them was actually, hey look, this is how we intend to fix all your issues, can you comment on this, is this a good plan? So this is like the sent issue and what they, how they wanted to fix it. So the lack of authentication that you can just like request all those um, messages, their proposed fix was, let's encrypt important parameters with AAS. And we have seen with Smart Dream how they implement AAS. It, like, I don't understand. Then they had a hard-coded API key that, was, that you had to use if you do all these requests. Um, not really that big of an issue, I guess, but ideally that would also be coupled with the authentication like a, a proper uh, API key per user. Their fix was, let's put the API key as a first step, let's put the API key into the binary because then it's harder to get to it maybe. I don't know what their logic is. You can still intercept the request and see the API key or you, know, you just look into the binary. It's like not that big of an issue. And, but, but there's a second step. Eventually, they want to get each user their own key. And depending on how that is implemented, that may even solve the authentication issue. So let's see how, how that will go. And then with the XSS of the messages, they were suggesting they could um, escape and replace special characters before they send it to the server. But that doesn't make any sense. Like, if I can like, just send this request directly, I don't have to remove those characters and just do it there. So it's just not the best practice how to fix XSS. You, you will filter the output where you, depending on the context where you place the output, right, and not like, in the application before you send it to the server. It just shows how Moiba is a not very advanced developer, I would say, and their quality of software is horrible. And it's scary that they spend those many millions on, on, these, on, on these applications. So Smart Dream is also just a big pile of poo. You have XSS, you have no SSL, lack of authentication authorization. You can access all the stored messages and Google searches uh, with the API, and that's just really sad. So, but let's have also now a quick look at the alternative applications, because as you have seen, like Moira reacted, more and more news is out there, so Smart Sheriff is maybe on a decline, I don't know, but I hope so. At least the alternative applications now get more popular, and the mobile operators, when you buy a phone from them or with them, they are now promoting their own application. So these are the uh, three alternative applications. It turns out that two of them are actually just uh, uh, developed by a third party company called Plantinet, and they are just like rebranding the design and the logo to, to match their mobile operator stuff. 
which is also funny because one of them had all the class names renamed and stripped, like basically obfuscated so you don't really know which class is doing what and their name was gone. But the other one still had the original class names in there, so it, we just used that one to analyze. That was cool. Also, there was a very personal, lovely message by Plantinet in one of the classes uh, as a string to us, and it reads, uh, damn you hacker, what is your benefit when decompile this app? Please don't disturb us. Here, uh, <laughs> yeah, and now you wonder why, are they, why don't they want us to look into this application? Like what possibly could we find in there that they really don't want to get out there? So let's just let your fantasy build and think about what they could like have in there. And I'm not saying what's all in, in, in these six gigabytes of backup blocks publicly available. Um, so what's up with the third one? Uh, that one was actually a bit more annoying. Uh, that one was encrypted and obfuscated, so they, every string, I, I don't know what they used, but every string was um, heavily obfuscated and they used a native uh, binary a library they are loading to uh, deobfuscate the scripts. And now I wanna show you two different approaches how you can defeat this obfuscation. Uh, first the lame one and then a cool one. So the lame one was mine. Uh, I just implemented, I just started an empty Android app and just made, did exactly what the application was doing. I just loaded the library, exposed the uh, decrypt function and just like decrypted all the strings. Works. I just use the, the obfuscation library against itself and that gets me the result. The cooler approach that you can do is obviously that Jeff from Citizen Lab did. He really reverse engineered the binary. Uh, he um, analyzed the algorithm that is used to deobfuscate uh, the, this long string which basically has, a, a, you can derive a key from that and then decrypt the second half with that and like the, just useless layers over layers to, to annoy you. And we found there, again, like no, no SSL use, no XSS, but we really didn't dig into these two, app, uh, um, these two different kind of applications too deeply because we mainly focused on smart sharing. But just a very quick look, like a few hours uh, during the Citizen Lab Summer Institute, we sat in the basement and looked at these alternative and we immediately found all this, uh, all this crap, so yeah. Okay, so a note for reflection. Yeah, so I would like you to I mean, I know it's hard, right? Like after we show you like how broken all this stuff was, but just, just make an effort and just pretend for a second that all these applications were perfectly somehow secure. Like they had like absolutely no security flaw or anything, right? Would you, <clears throat> in this like hypothetical, hypothetical scenario where all the applications are magically secure, would you trust like any company or government to have a database with all this information necessary for the apps to work? And that information is phone usage statistics, what times the child uses the phone, the, what applications they are using, or are blocked, the SMS, the IM messages that the child is sending, knowing the family associations, which phone number is the child, which phone number is the parent, the names are, and the birthdays of the children. Like, would you trust, like personally, any company or government, assuming that the applications were secure, like anybody? Right, so the concept is flawed, right? Like even if, if the applications were secure, like, like the whole thing is, is, is messed up, right? So what is happening next, or what was like a little bit happening before? The Korean government actually, because of this research, uh, introduced a new bill that adds an opt-out clause of this so that parents can decide if they trust their child to not have to install these things on their phone. Uh, that is a good step, I guess, but there will still be so many parents that are not tech savvy or are not, like, they are not that privacy concerned that, that don't find this very important to themselves and will um, still have it, and we kind of want the smart sheriff thing gone. And this a little bit weakens the argument that OpenNet Korea has uh, with the government, so that's, I don't know, maybe not, not a good solution, but at least a good step. It shows that the Korean government is, think, is seeing these issues and trying to uh, find a solution they are happy with. OpenNet Korea also filed a constitutional complaint about this law, but a result is expected in two to three years. 
So we will see uh, where, how long, uh, w what the result will be there. And um, then again, sorry. Um, and then it's open a career sitting there and tries to, what could we suggest the government? And one thing they are thinking about, should we create like a, like a, some, some sort of regulations. What should a parental monitoring app have? What should be the features and where exactly are the limits on what they are supposed to do and not to do? Because that clearly didn't happen with these applications that were developed there. There were no clear lists of what Moiva has to develop and it was just like, just develop something and they did it awfully. One could think, for example, if, we man if the government mandates an application like this, then let's make sure that, for example, there's no central server or something like this. That immediately eradicates a lot of the um, attack vector and po uh, possibilities for abusing, abusing an application like this. Um, so they are working on this and thinking about what, what they could define in these texts. Yeah, so if you wanna read a little bit more about this, you can read the official Citizen Lab reports. You can uh, read what OpenNet Korea is writing on their website about it. You can find some news articles. So for example, this one is also about um, a smart dream, like what happens if you text the word beer and it gets locked for your parents to read. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.